Muy buenas tardes, muy buenas tardes a todas y a todos ustedes, tanto a quien nos acompaña aquí en el recinto como a todos aquellos que nos siguen por los medios electrónicos de la Academia Nacional de Medicina de México. Vivimos nuevos tiempos caracterizados por la innovación y revolución tecnológicas. Las tecnologías disruptivas han impactado en todas las esferas del quehacer humano y de lo que no podríamos concebir en nuestra vida cotidiana sin ellas. La inteligencia artificial y sus múltiples vertientes avanzan de manera logarítmica y están ganando terreno en la medicina, en la ciencia básica, en la salud pública y en el quehacer clínico médico. La salud digital, la que sin separarse de la atención médica tradicional, se posiciona como una excelente aliada de nuestro quehacer cotidiano y que de seguro tendrá un lugar preponderante en los años venideros, es lo que nos une y nos reúne en esta sesión de gran importancia, tanto para la Academia Nacional de Medicina como para la Fundación Mexicana para la Salud. Y es una gran área de oportunidad que es obligada a adecuar e introducir a la atención en materia de salud, tanto en lo público como en lo privado, que estoy seguro, una vez implementada y acorde a los cánones tecnológicos, administrativos, normativos y médicos, será uno de los pilares de la salud pública y de la atención médica, tanto en lo particular y lo colectivo. De ahí por qué el interés de la Academia Nacional de Medicina y de la Fundación Mexicana para la Salud en estas nuevas tecnologías, a las que se han sumado un buen número de instituciones de educación y de salud, tanto públicas como privadas, tanto en nuestro país como a nivel global, lo que ha favorecido la apertura y están haciendo posible el cambio. Cualquier ruptura de paradigma induce miedo, miedo al cambio, al reto, a nuevas oportunidades, a la complejidad de la implementación y a los resultados inciertos. Pero para romper estas barreras, la ciencia y la investigación en salud y tecnologías disruptivas abren brecha y allanan las distancias. El doctor John Nosta, quien nos acompaña el día de hoy y a quien a nombre del presidente de la Academia Nacional de Medicina, el doctor Germán Fajardo Dolci y de su mesa directiva, le doy la más cordial bienvenida, es uno de los grandes expertos en este tema. El doctor Nosta, además de ser experto en este tema tan apasionante, es un gran divulgador de la ciencia, es un gran conocedor de las tecnologías disruptivas y ha dedicado buena parte de su vida profesional al estudio de la salud digital, la innovación en salud y en especial la inteligencia artificial. Es todo un gusto y un honor que nos acompañe el día de hoy, doctor Nosta, e imparta su conferencia relacionada precisamente a las nuevas tecnologías en el cuidado de la salud. Estoy seguro que será enriquecedora y que nos abrirá nuevos horizontes. Y sin más, dejo la palabra al doctor Héctor Valle, al licenciado Héctor Valle, para que nos dirija también unas palabras introductorias. Muy buenas tardes a todos ustedes, eh, un agradecimiento a la Academia Nacional de Medicina, a su presidente, al doctor Germán Fajardo, al doctor Carrillo Esper, gracias como siempre a nombre de la Fundación Mexicana para la Salud por siempre sumar, por siempre encontrar maneras de trabajar juntos y, y realmente preocuparnos por cómo hacemos que haya mejor acceso en materia de salud en la Fundación Mexicana para la Salud. Y trabajamos todos los días en entender cómo cerrar las brechas de acceso, cómo lograr que la población tenga más fácil acceso al personal de salud, que tenga acceso mucho más fácil a la infraestructura, a los medicamentos y a los dispositivos, porque siendo así, precisamente logramos que finalmente haya acceso a salud. Somos unos convencidos, por eso hemos venido trabajando en los últimos años en materia de salud digital y por eso nos complace hoy justo en la inauguración de la Digital Health Week que hacemos junto con Transform Health, el darla por inaugurada hoy con la presentación de John Nosta. Debo decir que es un gusto el grupo y cómo hemos venido trabajando, agradecer todo el trabajo que hacen en, en tema de Transform Health todo el grupo, eh, gracias a Gustavo Ross, por supuesto a Diana, a Ale, 
a Jaime, a Santiago y al resto del equipo. Muchísimas gracias a todos ustedes. Voy a hacer una breve semblanza, leer un poco la semblanza de John, a quien conozco bien y es muy buen amigo. John es un pensador crítico e influyente, con experiencia en tecnología, ciencia, medicina e innovación. Como fundador de Nosta Lab, un grupo global de expertos en innovación, se destaca por su enfoque en la transformación futura en diversas industrias. John es un líder en la intersección entre la tecnología y la humanidad, precisamente identificando y analizando tendencias tecnológicas globales. Él ha sido reconocido con honores, como un doctor, con un doctorado honorario y un diploma de honor por su impacto en la tecnología en salud. Sus asociaciones con entidades como la Organización Mundial de la Salud, con Google Health, con ARK Invest, consolidan su influencia en comunidades científicas y tecnológicas. Además, ha contribuido de manera muy importante en la investigación en fisiología cardiovascular y ha desempeñado distintos roles en agencias de comunicación, permitiendo la divulgación de todos estos hallazgos. En resumen, la carrera de John Nosta se caracteriza por su visión innovadora, su influencia realmente en tecnología, en medicina y su habilidad para comunicar ideas complejas de manera accesible. Su liderazgo continuo lo colocan como una figura destacada en la innovación global. Así que sin más, le cedo la palabra a John Osta. John, it's a pleasure to have you here in Mexico, so thanks for being with us today. Muchas gracias, Héctor. Y uh, Dr. Carrillo. Buenas tardes. And that's the end of my Spanish for today. So thank you very much. It is a, a great honor, a high honor to be here with great thinkers, with great leaders, with people who are helping to change the world. And that's what I want to talk to you about today because we are at a very unique time in human history. First and foremost, we are in the throes of Digital Health Week, celebrating Digital Health Week, but we're also celebrating a profound and important time in human history. I want to take you on a little journey about human history. And in preparing my remarks, I spent some time thinking about who I should be. We all work with GPT, with chat GPT, and we put in the prompt. So I was wondering, what should I do? What should my prompt be? It was an interesting question. And I thought maybe I could be a clinician, but no, that's not right. I have a very small background in clinical medicine. So not, I'm not going to be a clinician. Perhaps I can be a technologist, or perhaps I could be an innovator. Those seem to make sense. But today, I want to come to you as a philosopher, because the fundamental changes in the world today are not just clinical. They're not just social. They impact humanity on so many levels. So I want to push on the bounds of humanity and have us go on this journey and think about the world we're in today and try to understand how it's changing and how wonderful opportunities lay ahead for us. I work for a small think tank called Nasta Lab. Our job is to look at technology, to look at innovation, but not just to establish the innovation, but to establish the process by which innovation diffuses through a complex health system. In other words, what good is a good idea if no one uses it? And I don't think there's a better example than the medical system around the world where many times good ideas from technological innovations to simple hygienic innovations like washing your hands took many, many years to catch on. So in our world today, it's about the diffusion of innovation. So let's, let's jump in and let's get philosophical right from the beginning. And I have a question for the team, for the group here today. Is it okay to cheat? Yeah, that's a, that's a real question. Is it okay to cheat? Well, I want to take a step back into the world of art. As I stand before you today, I'm really, I'm, I'm so shocked by these beautiful paintings that look at me. And they, they create a portrait. It's art. It's, it's the art of medicine. But let's take a look at these, at these two paintings. The first one is The Girl in the Pearl Earring by the artist Vermeer. You know what Vermeer did? He used a camera and he traced the art. 
he provided, he used a level of technological augmentation to expand his craft. Now, the guy next to him, Norman Rockwell, was very interesting. Norman Rockwell would actually build a set, take a photograph by a professional photographer, and use a machine called a Lucy. And that Lucy would enlarge and stretch and move the image, and then Norman Rockwell would come in and trace it, painstakingly trace it and paint it. The interesting thing is, next time you look at a Norman Rockwell painting, don't look at the painting. Look at the signature. It doesn't have that beautiful script dynamic of, let's say, Matisse or Picasso. It's created using a stencil. Norman Rockwell and Vermeer stand before us as testaments to artistic and brilliant creativity. But they use technological augmentation to expand their craft. Hundreds of years ago, this is where we are in society today. This is where we are in medicine. We stand at a convergence where artificial intelligence and technology offers to be our cognitive partner, our cognitive partner as a tool to advance care. It's very, very interesting because in the throes of innovation and transformation, there's a word that comes up quite a bit, and that word is obsolescence or obsolete. Something becomes obsolete, and that's a function of innovation. Certain therapeutic modalities, therapeutic tools, industrial things become obsolete. Humanity doesn't change, humanity improves. But obsolescence is part and parcel of the transformative journey in technology and in innovation. Here's where we stand today. We are looking at the possibility of cognitive obsolescence. Let me take a breath and let's step back and explain what I mean about that. AI, particularly the new models, the large language models such as chat GPT, are making our brains functionally obsolete. And it's the first time in humanity that innovation has made us, our human faculties, become in the spotlight, subject to scrutiny, subject to comparison. Because in medicine, what is the standard of care? The standard of care is those guys up on the wall. The standard of care is the physician. But now we're shining a light on that healthcare provider. And the comparator is not the human standard, it's not the standard of care, but it's technology. So let's kind of explore this dynamic a little bit today. And let's start with a curve. Anytime you do a presentation on digital health or health technology, it's always good to put in this curve and talk about exponential change. That's the very nature of the world we live in. Change is happening rapidly, and it happens in a curved fashion. It started down at the end there where we have Google, the G word, the Gutenberg press, and how we've transitioned up in a hockey stick fashion to technological innovation. I don't want you to look too closely at this curve. You know why? It's obsolete. The curve itself is becoming obsolete because we're seeing something new in the marketplace. Exponential change is something that is with us. But let's talk about something that happened, oh, I don't know, six months ago? Not, not that long ago. We saw the emergence of chat GPT. Now, on the bottom, we see our exponential curve. That's, that's a smooth curve, exponential curve. But what we see with GPT, it went straight up. What does it mean? How do we make sense of this? Those of you who've studied math, those of you who've studied calculus, you know that when there's a zero in the denominator, that's a problem. The equation blows up. Or if you take the limit of a function where the, denom the denominator goes to zero, the function goes to infinity. So maybe here's a new word on the, in the lexicon of innovation, infinity. And the concept I want to discuss today, very simply, is that we're seeing something called innovation driving innovation, or AI driving innovation, where thinking machines speak to thinking machines, and the innovation becomes exponential in of itself. And that I'm referring to as stacked innovation. So the new dynamic today is not just exponential innovation, like virus multiplication. It's where innovation in AI itself drives intrinsic innovation, and that's stacked innovation. It's a frightening 
in a very, very powerful dynamic. But that sets the stage to where we are. Now, I have a question for you. What's the most efficient animal in the animal kingdom? The, the answer's actually changed over time. But as I understand it, back in the, in the old days, it was the cheetah. And I'm going to use that as an example for what I'm talking about today. The cheetah was the most efficient animal in the world. In other words, the velocity as a function of oxygen consumption. It was a physiologic construct. That animal was the fastest, most efficient in the world until someone sat on a bicycle. It was as simple as that. Someone made a bicycle and they created this thing called a gear and they created a mechanical advantage. That mechanical advantage was fundamentally transformative. It didn't make the cheetah very happy, but it also made mankind at a new level of achievement. And what we're seeing today is that that mechanical age that we started with, steam power, then we moved up to electrical power, and then we even got binary. We talked about the computer as a new tool for innovation. Then we moved into the digital age. I think for many of us, we live in the digital age today. For the past 10, 20 years, that's all I talked about. Let's digitize the medical records. Let's digitize that, that X-ray film, that PAX film, so we can transmit it, we can send it around the world. We live in the context of digital transformation, and we even talk about it in the context of digital health. It's a very appropriate word, but I think we're seeing the tail end of that word. We're moving into something now. We're moving into the fifth industrial revolution, a truly transformative time in human history. Let's take a deeper look at that. We're seeing a shift where AI partners with us to create or to establish the cognitive age. That's the precipice where humanity sits at today. This is a complicated slide. I don't want to drill too deeply to this, but if you look at that, the optimal quadrant, where we're optimizing both the left, the, with the X and the Y axis, we see a very, very interesting quote. And it simply says, humans and machines will dance together metaphorically. That's a social construct. It's a human construct. It's a clinical construct. That's the reality where we're moving. We're moving into a cognitive age. Now, just as we talked about earlier, the instance of obsolescence in the context of the cognitive age is a very, very interesting and a very, very precarious dynamic. But now we live in the domain of this thing called the prompt and large language models and GPT. And it's happening so quickly that it's startling. You know, in clinical medicine, speed is one of our biggest challenges, but it's one of our biggest tools. If a patient has a cardiac arrest, if we can resuscitate a person, defibrillate that person, get blood flowing back to the brain, we can have a good outcome. Speed is at the essence of medical care. But a study was done up at Harvard Business School, and they asked executives, they said, what's our, what's our biggest opportunity? What is our strength as a business? And they said, we're agile, speed to market, we could change. We can make things happen quickly to stay ahead of the marketplace or our competition. Then the next day they asked them the same question. They said, what keeps you up at night? And the answer was the same word, speed. That's where we live today. The rate of change is so extraordinarily fast that we're seeing things happen that I can't keep up with my slides. It's as, it's as simple as that. Yesterday, two things happened. One, ChatGPT4 became expanded to a more robust, powerful version. That was at the OpenAI conference. And Elon Musk announced that he is going to have his own GPT model. I don't know if you heard that, but it's a very interesting dynamic. Why is he doing it? He's doing it because Twitter is one of the greatest sources of data. The data stream, or some people call it the data fire hose, provides data that is real time. Is it perfect data? No. Is, is the history that my patient gives when you're seeing them in clinic perfect? No. That's the reality we live in. But we're seeing these rapid changes that every day there's something new. That's where we're moving to. 
And we're moving from that mechanical dynamic into a cognitive dynamic. So the age of digital health and digital medicine, that digital reality, is shifting into something that is completely cognitive. Now, we're beginning to cross a threshold where machines themselves are getting better than human output. And this is an example of where handwriting recognition, speech recognition, image recognition is crossing what is conventionally seen as the threshold of human capability. This is a perplexing and troubling slide. This is tantamount to what Ray Kurzweil has talked about as the singularity, when machines become smarter than people. So we're seeing this change, and there's two important points here. Not only are they crossing the threshold, but we're shifting from looks like handwriting recognition and speech recognition, which exists in an exponential perspective, to that stacked perspective where they're going straight up. Computer comprehension and language understanding are going straight up. That's the human perspective. That's the cognitive perspective we see in the regular good old fashioned large language models like GPT-3 and GPT-4. But even that's changing and that's changing very quickly because what we're doing now is taking conventional models and training them and teaching them. You know, sometimes I think that GPT, um, maybe Dr. Curio, you would agree with me with this. GPT might be like a medical student. It's smart. They're pretty smart. They know some basic things. They know the Krebs cycle, maybe, right? But you have to train them so that they become skilled physicians. And in a way, that's kind of what GPT is today. It's a medical student. It's an intern on that first year on the wards. They have the base knowledge, but they have to be trained. And what we see with this model is that looking at standardized exams, the red or pink are the trained models. And I don't want to get too deep on this, but what we're seeing is GPT models will become very, very specific to your needs. So for example, the news service Bloomberg that has a radio show and a TV show, and they even have a a, a terminal that you can buy, that you can watch stock data back and forth through the day. Bloomberg has their own LLM model now, where they overlay onto the LLM model financial information. So now as an investor, or as a chief technology officer looking to find out about a company, or as someone just with an investment portfolio, I can now interrogate that large language model and find out very, very interesting information. I have a friend Brian Rommel. Brian has taken all of the U.S. patent records, publicly available IP, taken them and put them into a large language model, and now interrogates them for ideas. So he asked the LLM model, he says, look through the existing patent data and find a new way to filter water that's very inexpensive. It's a game changer. It's fundamentally changing the way we do our business. And not only is it changing it in finance, it's changing it in medicine. And we're seeing these new models come out day in and day out, and they're fundamental game changers. Now, we talk about cognition and, and the domain of, of smart, because I think physicians feel very comfortable in the domain of smart. But we know there's another element out there, and that's called empathy. And what we saw, and this was a paper that was in JAMA, so it was a peer-reviewed paper. It was a reasonably important publication. And, and the, the observation was here that GPT is more empathetic than a doctor. Let's catch our breath and take another look at this. The first slide, it showed how the majority of GPT was evaluated as having good or very good responses. So it's skewed to good. Now when we look on the other side, we found that the physician skewed to being non-empathetic while the GPT model, this is a GPT-3 model, skewed to being empathetic or very empathetic. How do you make sense of this? I read this paper, I put it away, I slept on it, I came back, and I think it's true and false at the same time. Because I believe that we're seeing the emergence of AE. Not only artificial intelligence, but artificial empathy. And I challenge everyone in this room and everyone listening to think about the nature of empathy in clinical medicine, to think about the nature of empathy in politics, when the politician kisses the baby, is that a true sign of empathy or is that contrived? When you speak with your patient, gee, when my mom goes to her cardiologist, 
one of the most important drivers of her experiential aspect is not her numbers, is not her blood work, it's whether the doctor sat down and spoke with her a little bit and said, hi, Rose, how are you? How you feeling? How's John? I heard he's traveling to Mexico. That's what makes her feel good. Now, sometimes that empathy is real and true. Sometimes it's a bit contrived, but it's contrived for a reason, because we're driving an engagement with our patient that I think is directly linked to outcomes. So I think we have to revisit the nature of empathy as a tool. And when I talk, we'll talk about AE, artificial empathy, I think that it might be a real dynamic that's emergent from these models. It doesn't mean to diminish the emotional contribution the physician or the clinician makes to patient care, but I think we have to recognize that sometimes these language models can develop an empathetic perspective that is A, contrived, B, synthetic, and C, extraordinarily powerful. And that ultimately may impact care. Now, beyond the old number crunching of GPT, we're now moving into sensory GPT. Those of you who are following this, we see that there was GPT-3, GPT-4. Now there's a, a model called GPT-4V. It sees things. It's visual. It goes into this dynamic called a multimodal system. So now GPT can look at an image that you scan or get online, and it'll tell you what it is. And it'll analyze it for you. So think about this. It can, you can scan in a bowl of pasta, and GPT will tell you it's pasta primavera, and it'll give you the recipe. I'm not sure it's right. I'm not sure if chefs are going to agree with it, but that's the path. And the important thing to recognize today is that this is, the power of this is not where it is today. The power is the trajectory. Remember, speed. We're seeing a powerful trajectory. So we're seeing multimodal GPT, and we're seeing this feature now is blurring the lines between human function and technology function, because now GPT is beginning to see. GPT and AI systems are beginning to hear. Some are even beginning to smell. There are, there, there are systems out there now that are looking that are olfactory uh, initiated. So we're beginning to mirror or pair the human dynamic, which of course is fascinating and a little troublesome. I couldn't help myself, I couldn't help myself. So I take a uh, EKG of ventricular tachycardia. Those of you who have a background in, in this, it's a, a lethal arrhythmia. Ventricular tachycardia is when someone has a cardiac arrest. It often deteriorates into ventricular fibrillation. If you don't shock this person, it could be a terminal event. So I, I took a tracing, did a screen grab on, on my Mac computer, nothing fancy, put it into GPT-4, and I asked the question. This is the actual copy that it printed out. Now, in retrospect, I should have said, what is this? Because I gave it too much of a hint. I said, what is this arrhythmia? So I kind of said, oh, I gave half of the answer in the prompt. And there it is. The latter suggests an episode of ventricular tachycardia, life-threatening arrhythmia originating from the ventricles of the heart. This is nothing new. We're seeing this in, across all sorts of areas of medicine, radiology mammography. Now we're seeing the state of the art in many instances is a double read, human and physician. And the data is conclusive here. The data is that it's better for both to read than either system. That's what we're seeing. That's the dance where humanity and technology dance together. That was that early slide. That is the domain of medicine now. So that's, that's the direction we're going. Pathology is another area. Now, now, I don't even know if the domain of pathology, when we think of pathology, we often think of a frozen section, right? We think of a, a perioperative patient, we have a breast sample or a tissue sample, we go to the pathology lab, we look at it, and we make urgent decisions, speed-based decisions as to what we do. I believe that AI will begin to look at these patterns and see them in a way that is more powerful than human sensory perception. So the idea of a, of a frozen section, of a stain, of some sort of visual observation of tissue pathology may in fact be advanced 
by what AI offers us. So that frozen section may become something completely different that's going to aid the surgeon in care in the surgical procedure. So here's a question I have for everybody. Is the domain of human cognition the standard in which we live? Do we live in a reality that is definitive? I told you I was going to be a philosopher, so I'm really going to push hard on this one. Well, if you think about our sensory capabilities, our vision, about a third of us need glasses. But our vision, off to the periphery, is not in focus. I need to turn my head, and then it becomes in focus. We only see a small perspective of the electromagnetic spectrum. Our ability to perceive depth is a function of parallax view of two eyes. My dog, Oliver, a lovely labradoodle, can smell 20 times greater than I can. In fact, there's a reasonable body of data to suggest that these noses, these dogs' noses, can smell cancer or COVID. So their perceptual reality is quite different from ours. A bear in the forest, I learned recently, can smell 3,000 times greater than a human. That explains why our garbage can is always turned over. So our sense of reality is a modest interpretation of the reality in which we live. And technology now is offering an alternative, more informed view. And I want, I want to dig a little deeper on this because there's something very interesting. There's a, a short book, a novella called Flatland. I don't know if anyone's had the chance to read it. It's fascinating. It's about a world where people live in two dimensions. Just two dimensions, no height depth and width. And in this world where people live in flat land, one of them sees something fascinating. They see a dot on their world, and then they see a circle, and the circle becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. It becomes a dot and it goes away. What did they just experience? What did the flatlanders just see? They saw circles, right? Concentric circles, maybe, if you want to kind of build the story. You know what they saw? They saw a sphere. They saw a sphere move through their two-dimensional world. But they had no idea what a sphere was because they live in flatland. And I think to a certain degree, we live in flatland. That our sensory reality is a meager analysis of the world in which we live. So our ability to see in a colonoscopy, to have AI augmented visualization, to see a polyp before it's barely visible, to be able to act on that polyp, that early lesion, because of AI mediated vision, we can see better. We can use digital stethoscopes so we could finally hear a one over six systolic ejection murmur, or a click murmur, a mitral click, or even let's say an S3 systolic ejection sound in congestive heart failure. Very few people really hear them. I think that heart sounds are rumors in many instances. But what that does in a strange way is by letting us hear better, letting us see better, letting us sense better, we become in an abstract way more human. We become more human. And perhaps maybe that's the ultimate path with technology. Today, some of us have selfies or our picture on LinkedIn or our, our picture that we use, and it's not a real picture. It's a picture that AI created based upon two or three images that we put in. Now, those images are tuned. They're tuned. The technology knows exactly what to do. It knows to make me thinner, taller, nicer smile, hair combed. It makes us look like an idealized reality. That's called a hyper-reality. And there's been a lot of literature written about this. This contrived hyperreality is the world in which some people think we're moving towards. But I argue, unlike the hyperreality, and that's called a simulcra, a simulcra is a copy where there's no original. We can talk about that later. It's just enigmatic in of itself. A copy where there is no original. Those selfies of you that you put on your Facebook page are copies where there was no original. That's a hyper-reality, but I believe that maybe medicine and technology is exposing us to a world 
that is not a hyper-contrived reality, but a super-reality, that we become super-sensory beings in the context of care. So the reality that we can't define or see as humans because our sense of reality is very limited is expanded and dimensionalized by technology. Now, we all know Alan Turing, the Turing test. That was a test that said if a computer could, could believe, trick us into thinking it's, it's a human. Well, today, we might need another kind of Turing test, an, uh, an inverse Turing test that allows us to know if the data generated by AI is fit for human consumption. You know how we have labels on food? Not fit for human consumption? Well, maybe data has to be labeled that way because we, as humans, can't understand it. That multidimensional reality that AI creates that leverages five or six dimensions, that leverages images, that leverages coding, that leverages all sorts of components, creates a body of data that may not be accessible to us. That's why AI is creating a reality, and this domain that we live in is part of that cognitive domain. So it's complex, it's mysterious, and it's wacky. Here's a guy named Jeff Hinton. And Jeffrey Hinton was at Google for many years. And he, he looked at something interesting. He was looking at the large language models, and he says, you know, these, our brain has 100 trillion connections. About 100 trillion, a rough estimate. Large language models have a heck of a lot less, about maybe a half a trillion. Yet they process data that's better than a human brain. That's a reality that we have to contend with. You have to understand what the heck is going on here, that these large language models are extraordinarily processing machines. And he said that, you know what, maybe it's better. The algorithm is better than human processing. And it gets more complicated than that because he went on to talk about something that defines technology and AI today, and that's the word hallucination. Anybody who's worked with or read about the large language models hears that they hallucinate. Well, first of all, where did that word come from? It's a clinical word, right? So, so they're, they're taking pathology, they're taking abnormalities, and hallucinations are generally thought to be problematic in the context of, of, of psychiatric care. And he said that, you know, maybe these hallucinations are not quite what we think they are. He said that they're a lot like people. And people don't hallucinate, they confabulate. They come up with wacky ideas. Well, I think in some schools of thought, that wackiness, that confabulation, might live in the digital health collaboratory. It might live in our think tank. It might be the place where innovation is born. So I think that these large language models have this unique ability to do strange things. And this feature might not be a bug. It actually might be a feature endemic to the model itself. So I think this is a very, very interesting dynamic. Now I want you to think about some of your wacky, is that a word I can use in, in, in Spanish, wacky? A wacky professor who was a little out there, who kind of made stuff up sometimes. My 11-year-old son makes up stuff a lot. He's not hallucinating. He's confabulating. But it's the nature of his cognitive function as his brain develops. Remember, these are first-year medical students, these LLMs. These are interns. They don't know how to run a code. Why should we expect them to do that? They're in their infancy, and they're growing up. And we know that brain maturation takes up to age 25 to have, a, have, a, have a, a mature brain for cognitive function. So I think it's interesting when we talk about these models, and, and, and something that just happened recently that I wanted to put into this bundle of quotes here is the notion of persuasion. So Sam Altman, the founder of OpenAI with Elon Musk, said just a couple days ago, he said, you know, I'm not worried about artificial general intelligence. AGI, by the way, is the next level of AI. AI is sort of the base smart stuff. AGI is the super smart stuff that often people say is the Terminator the stuff that will control us and end life on Earth, blah, blah, blah. But Sam said, I'm not worried about AGI. What I'm worried about is super persuasive technology, AI, that knows how to persuade us. So immediately, immediately I went to clinical medicine. Then I took a step to politics. 
but persuasion is a fundamental, powerful human characteristic. The art of oratory, the ability to convince a tumor board or a patient to follow a certain course of therapy that is guided by fact and reason is very powerful. So what we're going to see coming up next is this idea of super persuasion. Are the output of AI, particularly GPT, so extraordinarily well written that they become powerfully persuasive? And that's part of our journey forward, and I think that, that it's very, very interesting. So let's try to create our own GPT. Imagine having your own GPT. What would that be like? Well, it would, it would have a great memory. It would have wonderful math skills. It would have tremendous attention to detail. It, it would be very literal, for better or for worse, extraordinarily literal, and would have focused interests. Okay? What does that mean? How could we personify our own private GPT? How many people have here seen the movie Rain Man? Yes? Famous American movie, Rain Man. That's GPT. There it is. Kim Peek. A brilliant, brilliant man. Take him to Las Vegas and let him play blackjack with you. Ask him what day September 8th, 1842 was, and he'll tell you instantly. That's GPT model today. Now, the emergence of these models, and the reason I talk about them in the context of your personal GPT, because I believe that's the path forward. What we're going to see is the base model, GPTX. There's a lots of models out there which consist of the corpus of human information, the Encyclopedia Britannica, what's online for Elon Musk. It's all the Twitter chatter. Interestingly, the other source of data with respect to Elon Musk is Tesla. There are millions of cars pumping data into the system, visual data. Not LIDAR, not radar, but visual data. We know that GPT is now a visual animal, just like humans. So what we're seeing is that you can create your LLM that's leveraged and dimensionalized with your personal data. Let's say it's your last 10,000 emails. Maybe you're an author and you can put your books in it. And this is not science fiction. This is being done today. There's a professor at NYU in New York who has his own GPT model. It's called profg.ai. Type it in, ask him a question. And based upon his written record that he puts into the system, you can get a very reasonable answer about what he would think about a corporate structure or an investment or why it's important not to follow your bliss in your career. He's got very, very interesting dynamics that he does there. So these LLM models will become personal. Maybe it's your health information that becomes integrated into this system. Maybe it's a hospital a hospital, or an intensive care unit. Let's take the intensive care unit patient data from the last 10 years or five years and layer it into an LLM. And let's have the opportunity to interrogate this model to look at cardiac arrests, intubation, sepsis, any of those things. And we look at it from the perspective of who? Of Kim Peek, of Rain Man. This is an extraordinarily opportunity. Now, now the interesting thing is we don't take Rain Man out all the time. We don't bring him to this room. Few people have access to this model. The model has private data. The model has financial data and may be only accessible to the chief of medicine or to key people who are in a fact-finding mission to help drive change. So LLMs are extraordinarily big and they're becoming extraordinarily focused. And what happens is they're revolutionizing business sectors. They have a blend of intelligence. They live on your computer. They don't live in the cloud. This is a problem. It's a problem for Microsoft. It's a problem for Google because they like the cloud. That's where they make their money. So these models live on our computers, in our systems. And they, often, they offer this unique dynamic of iteration. I want to talk a little bit about iteration because that is one of the magical components of technology today. We all have this thing in the back of our head, in our mind, called the internal monologue. We've all experienced it. It's that voice in our head. And that voice challenges us. What should I do? Should I call in sick today? I have a patient with a complicated scenario. Let me think that through. What's a possible differential? I bet you that most clinicians, before they articulate a differential diagnosis in front of a team of colleagues, 
they run it through their head a few times. Well, this iterative dynamic now is not only an internal monologue, it's an internal dialogue. GTT becomes an iterative cognitive partner. It goes right back to that beginning slide. It's a cognitive partner that helps us think. Now, is this new? It's, it's actually not new. I'm standing in front of Hippocrates. So let's talk about the Greeks and what they had to say about this. They had something that said, they said that, you know the way you educate people? You have an iterative dialogue. You talk back and forth. Well, think about that now. What's another iterative dialogue that is essential in clinical medicine? How about the physical exam? It's been said that that's the hallmark of the physical exam, the history and physical. A good history is critical. If you don't take a good history, you're not going to find out that the person had some sort of a, a, a engagement or fell or ate something that they were allergic to. The history, and that's an iterative dynamic, how you feel and what did you do, back and forth. That's the Socratic dialogue. That's the inner monologue externalized. The Greeks told us that that's the way you teach. The clinicians on the ward say, that's the way you teach. That's the standard. And today, we have that tool with the smartest person in the world, GPT. We have access to those language models. So we can sit down in front of the computer and say, teach me how to make guacamole. Give me the recipe. Change that. Make it the best guacamole in Mexico. It gives you the recipe instantly. Then you say, well, you know what? Take out the cilantro, because I don't like cilantro. It tastes like soap. And it's this iteration that is the power of these large language models. And the interesting thing is that it is the cornerstone of a medical education. It's the cornerstone of cognitive processing, iteration. And here's the interesting that good old Hippocrates said. Actually, I think it was Socrates who said it. He said, you know what? Don't teach people to write because it's going to ruin the Socratic dialogue. They didn't want to advance beyond that domain because they felt it would ruin things. Well, I've heard that excuse. I've heard that logic just for GPT. Well, you know, the Socratic dialogue, you know, when I, when I teach my medical students, that's a very human construct, and that's special. That's a one-on-one -on -one engagement. That's sacrosanct. That's Hippocrates. But it's not. LLMs offered the opportunity to have the Socratic method. And that's extraordinarily unique, unique and extraordinarily transformative. So my girls, my twin girls who were 15, were learning the Krebs cycle. So anybody who has spent time in medical school knows the Krebs cycle, the carboxylic acid cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle that makes ATP. It's the energy powerhouse in the mitochondrion, right? It's the bane of existence of medical students. They learn it, and the next day they forget it. That's a rite of passage. So my girls are trying to learn the Krebs cycle. So you know what they had GPT do? Write poems. Write a poem about the Krebs cycle to help me remember it. And they remembered it. I don't think there's anybody in medical school, in school unless they're a neurologist, and we know those, those guys are a little, a little odd anyway, but... Who knows the cranial nerves? Do you remember the cranial nerves? How did we remember the cranial nerves? We rent, there was a, an old Olympus towering top, a thin, whatever. There's a dirty one. There's all sorts of ones. There's one in Spanish. But that's how we remembered it. We used these tools. And GPT offered the opportunity to create a tool for my 15-year-old daughters to, to think about something like the Krebs cycle. And that leads me to a question in the context of digital health and medicine in medical school, and that's how do we reevaluate, how to redefine the academic heavy lifting, the rigor imposed upon clinicians and medical students today? And the question is, do we need to learn the Krebs cycle? Does it make you a better clinician? I don't know. Maybe it's a point of debate, but I think we're seeing a fundamental shift in the cognitive heavy lifting. Now, I spent time in, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital up in Boston. I work with a cardiologist named Eugene Brunwald, who's one of, one of the more famous cardiologists in the world. And if you were on rounds with Dr. Brunwald and, and he would ask 
he probably wouldn't ask this question to a fellow, but maybe ask it to a medical student. It asked the student, what are the five reasons for ST segment elevation on an EKG? I bet you the medical student wouldn't get all five of them, but could you imagine the medical student reaching into their pocket and pulling out chat GPT and finding that answer? What would, that, what would happen there? What is that whole construct? And that's what we're seeing now in medical school. We're seeing people leveraging technology to shift the cognitive burden, but that's true in medicine. No physician knows all the clinical trials. No physician knows the, the new theric modalities. No physician can get their head around the data. The only one who can do that is GPT, assisted by the clinician. And that's, that's the path forward as we, as we move on that. And large language models, big and small, are going to drive us along that trip. So I want to spend a little time talking about how we navigate this path. How do we live the life of exponential innovation that is now obsolete? Maybe it's stacked innovation. How do we manage it? How do we drive transformation? How do we get senior medicine, uh, senior clinicians to embrace new technology? It's tricky. And what we see today is a simple reality that the rate of data creation is far beyond our cognitive capacity. So what data ultimately becomes information or knowledge or even clinical utility is very, very small. So it's up to us as humans to kind of decide which clinical paper to read. How, how can you do that in good conscience today? To say, well, I'm busy, I'll, I'll try to get to the journals eventually. I, and, and this looks like a good article. I, I saw someone talking about it. How do we put our patients in peril by not managing this? And we live in a world of straight lines. We're not curved people. We don't like curves. Curve bothers people. You know, when you study math, y equals mx plus b. That's a linear line. That's a linear equation. It's kind of manageable. You know the slope. You know the y-intercept. It's reasonable. Once we get to x squared or x to the third, it gets pretty wacky. It's even hard to draw. So I want to ask you, I'm going to challenge you, take a look at this image. This is the Roman numerals. Thank goodness we're going into Roman numerals here today. How could we change this number, which is 9, into a 6 by adding one line? I couldn't do it. How do we add one line and make this into a 6? It's very, very simple. We use a curved line. We used a curved line. But everybody sp speaks to linearity, and that's, that's very, very, very fundamental. We live our lives on linear time. We grow our investment portfolios on a linear perspective. You know what I want to do? I want to increase my discharge rate. I want to increase my interest. I want to increase my investment by 5%, 10%. Year-on-year -year growth. That's the magic number, year-on-year -year growth. But the interesting thing about exponential change is when we live in this curve, and for many instances this is the dynamic of the day, even though stacked curves are happening, this exponential curve is very interesting. The early part of the transition, and that could be the adoption of telemedicine, it could be the adoption of genomic testing in healthcare, the early part of that transition is below linear growth. So we are all taught in business today to fail fast, fail fast. That path suggests that it may not be a good idea. The idea is to fail smart. So we have to recognize that exponential change and linear growth fight against each other. And we have to be highly aware of that. Now, last year there was a study by AT&T, the telephone company, and they looked at digital transformation in healthcare. So this is a very germane topic. And I said, okay, so what's the reason why people don't convert? Why can't we get more digital transformation in a medical system? And I thought it was going to be cost, ROI. Give me an ROI so I can support the million-dollar investment. But look at the one towards the bottom. 30, almost 30%, 30 one out of three, cited a lack of a coherent strategy. They didn't have a strategy. So when we talk about digital transformation in an office environment, in a company, I think even in a clinical setting, there's got to be a strategy. And that strategy is part of the hard part. Innovation is not evenly distributed throughout a system, a medical system, a hospital system. We don't need our copy machines to be 10% faster. 
We don't need that. We need our patient recruitment for clinical trials to be 10% better. So the judicious application of strategic thinking in digital transformation is fundamental. And when we talk about digital transformation, the one thing that really jumps out is that culture squashes innovation. So if you want to do an interesting protocol or a new clinical modality of care and the nurses don't like it, what happens? It's dead. It's dead in the water, right? So if I have a new prep, pre-surgical prep dynamic that I want nurses to do, if they don't buy into it, it's not going to happen. The rank and file, the people like you and me, have to understand that I have to become excited about transformation. So when we talk about digital transformation, we have to talk about it in the context of how it impacts the ward clerk, how it impacts the nurse, how it impacts the respiratory therapist. It's not just about the doctor, if you will. And we have to make people understand and get excited about digital transformation. That's why I'm here today. My job here today is to get you excited about the world we live in. And sometimes the way we do that is not to teach people about 1,6-fructose diphosphate or to teach people about CRISPR gene therapy that is saving lives or to teach people about a 5-Tesla MRI magnet that's going to show new images that I can feed into my expensive GPT machine. We have to get them excited. We have to share opportunities that are experiential. We have to teach them about GPT. We have to show them what it's like to be in a driverless car. Take your house staff in a driverless car and let them drive around in Mexico of all places. It's probably the perfect city to do it. And they'll see that technology is doing something that is truly, truly transformative. And then become, they become excited about the process of transformation, not the process of individual transformation, about the idea. And that becomes extraordinarily powerful many people. Now, this is a question where I always get in trouble, but I'll ask it anyway. Who's the smartest person in the room? If you ask this question in the hospital, it's the doctor. There's no doubt about it. And I think it's a reasonable question with a reasonable answer. Doctors are probably the most educated. They often have the highest experience. They have the highest level of responsibility. They have the highest level of accountability. So they have a certain hierarchy, and we see this in the hospital all the time. People stand up a little straighter when the doctor comes in the room. And, and that's, that's okay, but I think that we're seeing now that technology, that AI, that the new large language models empowered by fine-tuning around medicine are going to be, become functionally smarter than the doctor in a strange way. I struggle with that language, but I think it's something that we have to put on our radar. We have to begin to recognize that we now live in, let's go back to the early slide, we live in the cognitive era. It's no longer about the mechanical advantage. It's no longer about digitizing the x-ray and sending it to the neurologist on the other side of town or the other side of the world. It's a cognitive construct. And that cognitive construct is largely defined now by AI and technology, and it's happening so quickly. Now, innovation doesn't imply it's going to happen. The diffusion of innovation is a very complex thing. And I want to tell you a little story about uh, a keyboard. Now, when we type on our QWERTY keyboard, the Q-W-E-R-T keyboard, why, why was that invented? Why were those keys put in those positions? Well, the story goes, the myth goes, that it was to slow people down. It was to slow you down because what happens in those old-fashioned typewriters is the keys would stick if you typed too fast. So around 1932, this guy named Dvorak said, you know what, I can make a better keyboard. I can make a keyboard that's ergonomically designed that lets you type faster. It was a miserable failure, a miserable failure. The interesting thing is the Dvorak keyboard is available on Amazon today if you want to try it. You can actually get it and, and, and just change your... your your keyboard and, and get an inexpensive keyboard. But here's the point. It failed for two reasons. It failed for two important reasons that I think are extraordinarily relevant to medicine today. Number one, it was a capital expense. In those days, it was expensive to buy a new typewriter. So if you wanted a QWERTY keyboard, you had your Remington typewriter, that big thing, cost 100 bucks. So if I want to get a new keyboard, I need a new typewriter. I'm not going to get it. I'm not getting the, I'm not getting the five Tesla MRI machine, as much as the images are better and more powerful, I can't afford it. It doesn't fit into my budget 
And that, that's a real fundamental reality in medicine today. It doesn't fit into budget. But the other thing, it doesn't fit into workflow, which is just as important. Sometimes new innovations are really cool, but it doesn't work into the way that medicine is processed. But here's the other one. Here's the interesting thing, is that it didn't work because nobody wanted to learn a new key methodology. Would anyone in this room want to learn a new keystroking methodology to type 15 or 20 percent faster? I don't think so. So oftentimes innovation doesn't get adopted because it doesn't offer a significant benefit in the context of, let's say, clinical medicine. But here, here's the other thing. It required clinicians in the medical model to learn a new process. Now, here's the phrase that always comes up and is the biggest single impediment to innovation, largely in the healthcare system. When I approach a clinician, I say, Doc, you know, I think there's a new methodology here to evaluate this nodule or to evaluate osteoporosis in a large cohort of women. What's the first thing she says to me? It's not the way I was trained. That's the, dual, that's the reality of medicine today, is that the way clinicians are trained, that knowledge database establishes a, a trajectory. And that's part of the problem with the Dvorak keyboard, is that we are trained in that way. So when we see clinicians and we ask them to do something new, it goes against their training. And we live in a, in a hierarchical structure in medicine. And that, that's a problem. It's not, it's not an insurmountable problem, and it's also a valid problem, because the way they're trained is a good thing. Look at all these people on the wall. They did the training. Now, Stephen Jay Gould, a professor at Harvard, had an interesting proposition. He said that innovation doesn't happen in that smooth curve, that exponential curve that we talk about. Innovation happens kind of like this. Nothing happens. Nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. And then an asteroid hits the Earth and the dinosaurs die. That's the nature of transformation. And I, th I hear that analogy applied to medicine today. And you know what the asteroid is? Anybody want to guess? COVID. COVID was the asteroid that hit the Earth and, ch and challenged paradigms of care. Now, that's wrong. Because if you look at the data, if you look at telemedicine visits, boy, March... Hector, I was, in, I was in Mexico with you, March 2020. I just escaped back into the United States. And then we saw telemedicine visits rise. They rose. Now here we are, two years later, and many of those telemedicine visits have fallen back to baseline. So I don't know, did, were patients really changed? Was clinical practice changed in a fundamental way with COVID? I don't know, maybe we got a little bit more sensitive about about. about Masking, you know, maybe we got a little bit more interested in, in supply chain dynamics, maybe. But I don't think it was the dinosaur that killed the, that was the asteroid that killed the dinosaur. You know what is? AI. AI is the punctuated equilibrium proverbial asteroid that hit the Earth, and it hit the Earth six months ago. That's what's changing. That's the reality, I think, that's really pushing us in new ways. It's shifting us from a mechanical world, from a digital world, to a cognitive world. And that's the world that clinicians live in. I mean, there are certain physical skills to a certain degree. There are surgical skills. You know, there are sensory apparatus that are important. But we live in the world of cognitive medicine. Now, I'm wearing my black T-shirt. I apologize for not wearing a tie. I think I should have a tie here. But I'm going to channel my inner Steve Jobs for you because I'm wearing my black T-shirt. And he said something very interesting about the early days of radio and the early days of television. He said, you know what television is today? He said, television is nothing but a radio show with a TV camera in front of it. And I think in many instances, that's what telemedicine is today. In the United States and in Mexico, it's a Zoom call. The physician is sitting at her desk, and nothing has changed. We're not using advanced analytics. We're not using devices. We're not using EKG machines. We're not using at-home stethoscopes. We're not using any devices. We're just sitting in front of a Zoom call and talking with our patient. That's not really an advance. That's telemedicine 1.0. Our challenge here, and particularly in medicine uh, and in Mexico, is to leverage telemedicine 2.0. That's our challenge. That's where I think we can find unique opportunities. There are devices and, and technologies today that'll help us do that. 
And as we pass through this, this dynamic of change, as we tell, as we ask who's the smartest person in the room and we upset our clinician friends, and we realize that we are in a cognitive era where human cognitive function is going down the road of obsolescence, or at least to be thought of as obsolescence. It comes to us in pairs. It comes to us as the dynamic of wonder and fear. And I want to talk about our first technology. Our first technology was fire. Now, what did fire do? It allowed us to heat our dwelling. It allowed us to migrate to colder climates. It allowed us to stay up at night. It allowed us, this is a good one, it allowed us to eat food, cook meat, and eat protein to grow our brain. And that had a significant impact on human cognition and transformation. It also allowed us to make nasty weapons to kill our friends. Fire had a duality of wonder and fear. And as we move through history, as we go to the airplane, same thing. The airplane lands in your wheat field in 1917. The pilot comes out, takes off his goggles, and says, come on for a ride. Would you do it? Nope. You wouldn't do it. It took a lifetime for you to want to do it. It took 67 years to reach 100 million customers and become the safest form of transportation there is. By the way, it took Facebook three years to reach 100 million customers, and it took Pokemon Go 19 days. I don't even know how many days it took GPT because it went straight up. But the duality of wonder and fear exists in many, many aspects of our lives. The driverless car, where all seats face the center, is a classic example of allow allowing us to experience the wonder and the fear. But it also may be a way for us to have an experiential relationship, experiential relationship with innovation. The bigger the fear, the bigger the wonder. The bigger the wonder, the bigger the fear. Now, interestingly, the biggest, single cause, the biggest single cause of property damage in the world today is what? Fire. Did we mitigate the risk of fire? No. We managed the risk of fire. And that's the analogy for AI today. We're not going to mitigate the risk of AI. We're going to have to manage it. And that's much more complex than fire, than, 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 than managing fire. But that's where we are today. The bigger the risk, the bigger the fear, the bigger the wonder. And AI is, simply put, the most fantastic aspect of human creation ever. And it lives with us with that dangerous fear emotion. Now, where do we get our information when we're sick? We go to the doctor, right? Where do we get our information about AI? Hollywood, right? The movie, The Terminator. Our perspective of a dystopian reality with AI is not mediated by science. It's mediated by show business. And I think we have to be very, very careful about that. The risks are not unreal. The risks are not unimportant, but I think they're extraordinarily imaginated. So in today's world, you've got to be smart. That defines clinical medicine in many ways. Your IQ is very important. In today's world, you have to be empathetic. We have to be compassionate and empathetic to our patients, to the world we live in. Those are two important constructs. But I believe that we need another Q. We need a TQ in today's world technology quotient, our ability to assimilate technology into our lives, into our school rooms, into our operating rooms, into our exam rooms, is an independent arbiter of success. It's no longer an option, it's an imperative. And I think we can measure, actually measure technology quotient using a variety of modalities. It's not a number like IQ, it's actually a shape. Institutions can measure their, IQ, their EQ and their TQ. And I think in the final analysis, what's going to happen is that, yes, there might be loss of jobs. Of course, I think that jobs will also expand. I think that there will be a lack of human touch in certain constructs. There will be sort of a lack of emotional intelligence in some of these systems. But they will be profoundly outweighed by efficiency, accuracy, precision, decreased workload, economic and clinical advantages. And there's one other thing I want to bring to your attention about this as I wrap up my discussion for today. A small study was recently done that looked at GPT and writing performance. And what they showed is that GPT improved accuracy, I think these numbers are probably close, by 17%, improved speed by 20%. But there was a third parameter. Nobody talks about this. It improved enjoyment. It improved the relationship with the task. In other words, there was an element of self-actualization, that I enjoyed what I was doing, that I was intellectually stimulated 
that I had a, a conversation with a, with a smart friend that was crafted by the prompt that developed something that I enjoyed. Now, around the world, we hear a lot about burnout, about significant problems in healthcare, particularly in the United States. It's a, it's a big issue about physician burnout and fatigue and even, even suicide. So when we look at GPT, we have to look at it as an accurate model, as a smart model that moves fast, speed, but it very well may be a model that engages us like Hippocrates would say about that Socratic dialogue. It's a wonderful, engaged dialogue where we can blossom creatively. You know, when you're on the wards or when you do a differential diagnosis or you figure out a complex problem, a cl complex clinical problem, how do you feel? You feel good. You feel empowered. You feel excited. You feel realized. That's where technology is moving us today. So when we talk about the clinical engagement, between technology and man, I don't think it's a subservient one. I think that there's a duality, and the duality is going to raise up human cognition and take us to new, exciting, and fascinating places. So the path forward, I think, is really, really interesting. Now, I'm going to show something, and I'm going to cue the camera a little bit here. Can you guys see this? Can anybody see this? Anybody want to guess what it is? Some of you might know. You might know. This is a stethoscope. It's a stethoscope. Now, we all know what the purpose of the stethoscope is, right? It's to identify the doctor in the room. You know, when the, when the woman walks in the room and has a stethoscope draped around her neck reverently. You know, there's only two professions that do that. They're doctors and the clergy who wear their garments like a religious prayer shawl. And about 150 years ago, when Lenach invented the stethoscope, it was a piece of wood, a tube, and he'd put it over the patient's chest and he'd listen. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. It's still the same tool. It's still the same tool that relies upon what? Our hearing. Probably the weakest of our senses. Now, this comes along, and this stethoscope actually lets you see the lub dub. It synchronizes the lub dub with a single lead EKG and creates something that is tantamount to a systolic time interval that allows us to begin to ascertain contractility. Contractility. So now we can look at rudimentary ejection fraction, if you will, and we can have our patients use it. So it no longer rests on the shoulders of the clinician, but it may rest in the pocket of our patient who's watching the football game and wants to send a telemetric signal to their physician about their cardiac function because they're symptomatic. That's the transformation where it goes from doctor to patient empowerment. That's the path, and that's the path I want to discuss just for a couple more minutes. This also is an EKG machine. Now, many of you might remember the old-fashioned EKG machine made by Hewlett Packard. It was a big white box. It was on four wheels, and we'll wheel it into the patient's room. This is a, a device that was invented by a cardiologist, an electrophysiologist named David Albert. And it takes your EKG, dumps it to your phone, puts it up to the cloud, and it's analyzed. Most, most typically these days, it's used to determine an arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation, which is associated with stroke, and those strokes are particularly bad. What happened here? Here's the path. We took that big clunky EKG machine on four wheels, and we digitized it. That's the first step, the first D word that I want you to remember. Digitization allowed us to make it small. So it's no longer on few, four wheels that we wheel down the hallway. It fits in our pocket. D materialized. Dematerialized becomes very inexpensive. Demonetized. And ultimately, digitization, dematerialization, demonetization leads to democratization where patients have access. That's access. Where do you get this now? Which is, I think, the best, the best punctuation to a story. You buy it on Amazon. Who would have thought that our clunky EKG machine, of course, this is a single lead, now lives on Amazon for about $80? That's the path of innovation. And I want to share with you just one concluding thought about this nature of transformation and the journey that we're on today. And it was by 
a famous author who wrote the book Future Shock. His name is Alvin Toffler. He said that the illiterate of this century will not be those who can't read or write. Not read or write. The illiterate of this century will be those who can't unlearn and relearn. And that relearn is a cognitive construct. And that's the first step into the era today that we call the cognitive era. Thank you all very much. <clears throat>
Gustavo Ross y ahora el doctor Nosta, y esto habla de cómo la Academia Nacional de Medicina en esta alianza estratégica con FunSalud está dando este cambio, este giro, este cambio de paradigma, que como también lo comentó el doctor Nosta, da temor. Estas máquinas voladoras que hace 100 años nadie se imaginaba, estas naves espaciales que hace 40 años nadie se imaginaba, bueno, y que son una realidad. Pero al inicio causa temor, resquemor y miedo al cambio, pero esto se está logrando modificar en la mentalidad de mucha gente, tomadores de decisiones, médicos, investigadores, científicos, y está dando excelentes resultados. Y ejemplo de ello es todo lo que oímos el día de hoy del doctor John Nost. Así que, de nuevo, muchas gracias, John. Y bueno, para cerrar la sesión, le quiero pedir al licenciado Héctor Valle, gran amigo de esta academia y líder de FunSalud, que nos dirija unas palabras para cerrar la misma. Gracias, Héctor. Gracias, Carlitos. Muchas gracias. Iba a acabar todo el rollo y no iba a llegar a ningún lado. No, muchísimas gracias, doctor Carrillo. Siempre muy agradecidos en la Fundación Mexicana para la Salud con usted. Un saludo y un abrazo al doctor Germán Fajardo. Eh, gracias siempre por la soledad. John, thanks for coming again to Mexico. And we'll see you soon. Así que muy buenas tardes a todos. Que tengan una feliz tarde. Y solo agradecerle al doctor Nosta que siempre viene con nosotros, John, y desearle un pronto regreso, que regreses bien a casa y te vemos pronto en México. Gracias. Gracias.